Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am your host, Kathleen Bates. We hope you are as excited as we are to hear from a few experts in the field of tobacco prevention and control. Between the two of them, they have a wealth of knowledge to share with you all today. Before we start, just a few housekeeping reminders. As you encounter technical difficulties, um, uh, please use our chat box at the bottom of the screen and type those in for further assistance. We'd also like to remind you to type your questions for our presenters in the chat box throughout the webinar. When the presentations have concluded, we will have time to answer those questions. So the topic today is electronic cigarettes. While cigarette use has declined among youth, e-cigarette use has been on the rise. As usage rates increase, we're all, asked, we're all tasked with the goal of educating and protecting our youth. But the question is, how can we do it? So our first presenter today is Dr. Joel Dunnington. Dr. Dunnington recently retired in September 2014 as a professor of diagnostic radiology at UTMD Anderson Cancer Center, where he dedicated 25 years to the academia. His interest in tobacco control started as a sophomore medical student when he attended a lecture by Alan Blum, MD, the founder of DOC, at the American Metal Student Association Convention in 1978. Over the next 12 years, his main tobacco control activities included the American Medical Association and Texas Medical Association. He started the American Medical Association Tobacco Coalition with Steve Hansen, MD, a delegate from California, where he helped produce tobacco control policies. He spent 13 years at the Texas Medical Association's Council on Public Health and six years on the Cancer Committee serving as chair with a principal focus in tobacco control. He has also chaired the TMA Task Force on Tobacco for five years and represented the Texas Medical Association at the Texas Interagency Council on Smoking or Health from 1991 to 1995. During those five years, he served as vice chairman, chairman and the editor of the Tobacco Free Texas newsletter. During the mid to late 90s, Dr. Dunnington was the chief tobacco consultant with the Texas Attorney General's Office on the Texas Tobacco Lawsuit. During this time, he also worked for the American Cancer Society Houston Metro area and chaired the Great American Smokeout, where he was appointed to the Houston Metro Board of Directors from 1994 to 1998. He served as the president of the Houston Metro ACS from 1995 to 1997, focusing on tobacco control and prevention. In 2004, he won the Elkins Faculty Achievement Award for Prevention from ND Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Dunnington is also the recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Texas American Cancer Society for Tobacco Control. In 2011, he received the Health Leader in Medicine Award from the Texas Medical Association Foundation for his work in public health, especially tobacco control. He has collaborated with cancer prevention researchers at MD Anderson, consulted with tobacco activists across the globe, presented his wealth of knowledge to students ranging from second grade to postgraduate medical school, and has worked with community groups and coalitions concerning their efforts in tobacco control. Since 1989, he has served as a member of Smoke Free Texas, working to pass smoke free laws across the state. Currently, Dr. Dunnington serves as a board member for Americans for Non-Smokers' Rights, as well as secretary of the board. Dr. Dunnington, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay, I think slides are working now. So I usually start off my lectures with, what's the number one killer in the United States? Alcohol, cocaine, heroin, AIDS, tobacco, car accidents, fires, homicides, or suicides? Actually, tobacco kills more people in the United States than all the rest of these put together, even today with the opioid epidemic. So just a brief to get a perspective of what we're talking about today and how important this is, tobacco causes 480,000 Americans to die every year in the United States, 28,000 Texans die every year from tobacco. That's 1,315 people every single day. But remember, for every person who dies from smoking-related disease, about 30 more people suffer from it uh, from at least one serious illness from smoking. And also remember that the major tobacco companies, the Tobacco Institute and the Council for Tobacco Research, all were judged guilty of civil racketeering, racketeering, conspiracy, and lying 
on August 17, 2006. So these folks are racketeers. So e-cigarettes. So this is just a list of some of the different names we have for e-cigarettes. So e-cigarettes, electronic cigarettes, uh, e-cigs, hookah pens, e-cigars, e-hookahs, uh, vape pipes, vaping pens, um, e-cigars, vape tanks, mods, uh, e-vapor device. Um, nowadays, they seem to like more the personal vaporizer or the advanced personal vaporizer. Um, and then you go on down the list to Juul, and the very last is like electronic smoking devices. So I think um, a lot of times they keep changing the name just so those of us in academia who don't use these um, look out of date. In 1965 was the first U.S. patent for e-cigs by Herbert Gilbert, but uh, it apparently didn't go anywhere, and um, so nothing ever really happened with this patent. And then... Um, in the early 2000s, there was a pharmacist in China, uh, Hong Li, who invented the current version of e-cigarettes. Um, this he set up a company, and then it was bought by others and spun off. And e-cigarettes were introduced in the United States somewhere around 2006-2007. So the components of e-cigarettes. So the components of e-cigarettes. Um, Um, I was trying to get the little marker here for you. So various ones look different, but basically you have a mouthpiece, you have the uh, heating coil in here. This is the heating coil. You have the clear tank where you put your e-cigarette juice in, and then the, the other second portion of the, uh, the second main portion of the e-cigarette is the battery. And some of these are individual batteries, and some are recyclable, uh, rechargeable batteries. And then some have a puff power button, and some have a circuit board with an electronic device that tells when you're inhaling on the, on the cigarette. Uh, there are a number of different e-cigarette products. Um, actually, there's a plethora of these, from e-pipes and e-cigars to the larger tank devices or the mods or the advanced uh, personal vaporizers uh, come in many, many different styles and shapes, uh, the medium-sized tank devices. Uh, those two groups produce the most uh, heat and give you the highest nicotine levels. Then there's rechargeable e-cigarettes, and then there's disposable e-cigarettes. The one on the right is the uh, newest of this group, and it's called a Juul. Um, and this is one that's gained uh, favorability with the kids, especially. Uh, it's easy to hide, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later in the talk. And then there's the fluids. There's at least 8,000 uh, different types of flavors of the fluids, uh, all types of flavors. Here's an example of bubblegum, chocolate, cotton candy, grape, and gummy bear. Um, many of these do not have childproof caps, so if the little children around the house get a hold of these, um, they're very toxic, and it's something to have to worry about. Refilling devices. This is how you take the e-liquid and fill the, uh, the um, reservoirs on all these. Probably ought to be wearing gloves when you do this. If you spell it on your hands, uh, the nicotine is toxic enough to uh, cause problems. And something to think about. So when e-cigarettes were introduced, in the United States. Uh, there was no human subject testing to evaluate the harmful effects of these devices by the manufacturers. Um, there was no human testing of the use of e-cigarettes for cessation that was submitted to the FDA to market them as cessation devices. Uh, there's been totally unregulated human subject testing of e-cigarette marketing and flavors by the manufacturers. So although they didn't bother testing beforehand, um, to show they were safe, they didn't mind actually testing on humans to market them. And the ingredients to an e-cigarette. So the main is propylene glycol and or glycerin. Um, the flavors are dissolved and the nicotine is dissolved in the propylene glycol. Uh, the glycerol apparently, the higher content of glycerol makes the, the vaping fog clouds bigger and bigger. Um, plus or minus nicotine, so most have nicotine in them. Uh, nicotine is extremely addicting and used to be an insecticide. 
and then all types of different flavorants, but no water. So the important thing to remember, there's no water in e-cigarettes. The only water that comes out is what was in your lungs to start with. And this is scary to me. You can buy a half gallon of pure nicotine online nowadays. Um, this is enough to kill approximately 19,000 people. So nicotine is an extremely toxic chemical. Now, finding vapors who use uh, non-nicotine e-liquids is kind of like finding unicorns. There just really aren't too many of them around. So FEMA, this is the Flavor and Extract Manufacturers Association. Um, they have come out talking about the flavors that e-cigarette folks use um, in e-cigarettes. So there's no apparent direct regulatory authority in the United States to use flavors in e-cigarettes. In this context, it is important to note that the generally recognized as safe, that's called GRASS, the acronym GRASS, provision in the FDA uh, and the Cosmetic Act applies only to food, not to inhalation. So e-cigarette and flavor manufacturers and marketers should not represent or suggest that the flavor ingredients used in e-cigarettes are safe because they have FEMA grass status for use in food because such statements are false and misleading. And e-cigarette manufacturers and marketers should take appropriate action to assure the safety of flavor ingredients used in e-cigarettes. FEMA grass status for the use of flavor ingredients in food does not mean that FEMA grass flavor ingredients are safe to use in e-cigarettes when inhaled. So heat-induced e-cigarette toxic chemical aerosols. The higher the e-cigarette voltage, the more toxic the chemicals are that are produced in the aerosol. Bigger coils and bigger batteries equals more nicotine and toxins. The mods, the advanced personal vaporizers, uh, can be modified to produce very high temperatures and much more toxic chemical byproducts. So what's in an e-cigarette aerosol? So you have nicotine. You have volatile organic compounds. You have ultrafine particles. Now, the particles that come out in e-cigarette liquids, uh, aerosols, are actually smaller than what comes out in the cigarette smoke. Um, flavoring such as diacetyl, which is known to cause uh, pulmonary fibrosis in people. Uh, heavy metals such as nickel, tin, and lead are not good to be inhaling. And cancer-causing chemicals. There have been a number of these identified. So just some of the toxins that have been identified in e-cigarette aerosols. Uh, they've been shown to cause DNA damage in animal models. They emit heavy metals. They emit ultrafine P2.5 particles and actually smaller particles than uh, or in cigarettes. And they have been shown to damage the heart and the heart vessels. They produce carcinogens like formaldehyde and acrylin. Uh, they cause asthma and exacerbate asthma and a number of others. So the industry says propylene glycol is an asthma inhaler, so they're safe. Uh, propylene glycol is not in any asthma inhaler at this time. Uh, nobody has ever performed scientific studies to evaluate long-term inhalation exposures of the human lung to propylene glycol, glycerin, or flavorants. So the industry says nicotine is as safe as caffeine, according to vapor enthusiasts. The evidence is sufficient to infer that at high enough doses, nicotine has acute toxicity. The evidence is sufficient to infer that nicotine activates multiple biological pathways through which smoking increases the risk of disease. And the evidence is sufficient to infer that nicotine exposure during fetal development as a critical window for brain development has lasting adverse consequences for the brain development. And the evidence is sufficient to infer that nicotine adversely affects maternal and fetal health during pregnancy, contributing to multiple adverse outcomes such as preterm delivery and stillbirth. The evidence is suggestive that nicotine exposure during adolescence is a critical window for brain development and have lasting adverse consequences for brain development. Now, this is uh, some of the reasons for, for vaping. This is from 2017, from information from 2012 and 2015. And we can see that the cost is a very small factor. Flavor choices, maybe 15%. Um, safe to use is 8% or so. Can vape indoors? It used to be higher, it's gone down. Uh, favorable odor has gone up a little bit. Uh, quitting combustibles has gone down. It used to be higher, up around 40%.
And then the last one is social image. That is picked up in the last three years. So it's more important that your image is good while you're smoking an e-cigarette. An estimated percentage of high school students who currently use any tobacco products. And you can see over here total of all tobacco products is up around, uh, it used to be last year was 25%. It has now dropped to 20. Any combustibles is now down to less than 15. And e-cigarettes, which were climbing, finally took a dro drop uh, this last year. Now this is for middle school students. The last one was for high school students. These are middle school students. You're still up there about 7% or so for any tobacco product. And e-cigarettes, uh, again, were climbing in the middle school kids but they have dropped off a little bit uh, this last year. Hopefully we'll continue that drop. And then just to give you an idea of what's being sold uh, at the stores, if you go in convenience stores and look, um, the main ones are Views, uh, Mark 10s, Blues, Logic, and Jewel down there at 7.75%. Now remember the 7.75% because um, Jewel is picked up. This is what Juul looks like. It looks like a large USB um, device, um, and the actual charger part looks like a small USB device when plugged into your computer. And these are the packets, and these little packets contain very potent nicotine uh, concentrations. Uh, they're like 59 uh, milligrams per milliliter. That's a very high concentration of nicotine. Juul over the past year, the labs have generated a whole bunch of money in retail sales. But more importantly, the brand saw sales explode 621% year over year and captured 32% of the market share. Remember on the last one I showed you from two years ago, it was 7.7%. Here in November 2017, that week, it had gone up to 32% of the e-cigarette market. So a very rapid increase, um, mainly by youth. Uh, the multinational tobacco corporations uh, all own or started uh, e-cigarette uh, units within their companies, and so all of them are now in the e-cigarette advertising war. E-cigarette markings all over the media and the internet. So the question is, will it save us from a tobacco smoking epidemic uh, or add to it and make a bunch of folks rich at the public's kids' expense? So if you look on the internet and you go to some of these e-cigarette sites, uh, you take a look at them, the opening page uh, usually has uh, uh, high-level security like this, where you have to say, if yes, I'm older than 21, or no, I'm younger than 21. Uh, and this is new because it used to be 18 uh, on most of the sites. How do they advertise? This is one of the ways they advertise. But not only cigarettes, but e-cigarettes. Um, we first saw e-cigarettes in uh, 2010 with Johnny Depp in a movie, The Tourist. Uh, it's now picked up. And you notice uh, 2015 was a good year here um, with, multiple, uh, with multiple movies in 2015 having e-cigarettes. And when you see these in movies, they're almost always placed somehow. It's part of product placement. And especially if you can actually see the brand of the e-cigarette or the cigarette, um, somebody paid to put that in there. It's not by accident. Now, folks, when you start to thinking about how many Starbucks you have in your neighborhood, how many McDonald's you have in your neighborhood and how they're ubiquitous and on every um, single um, street corner. Well, take a look. Take a look at the McDonald's, 14,000, Starbucks, 12,000, 370,000 tobacco retailers in the United States. Uh, truly impressive number. So if you think these are a lot, just contemplate 375,000. And when you go to those convenience stores, what do you see? You walk in the door, there's an ad on the door. Now, 
you know, marketing one on one shows um, that you need to do ads that people see. So when you walk into this door, is your belt buckle seeing this ad very well? If it's not your belt buckle seeing it, then who is this ad for? Whose eyeball level are these at? These are a kid's eyeball levels. And sometimes it's the bottom half of the door, which is even lower. And then once you get inside the store, what do you see? You see the tobacco power wall back here, okay, which definitely impresses kids. Um, but look up front. So you got the candy and the gum here. Uh, you've got all your uh, cigarette lighters here. And then here's the blue e-cigarettes all up front for who to look at. And then one of the things that attracts kids and teenagers and young adults is you can actually uh, smoke e-cigarettes and go to competitions where you can have vaping com competitions and cloud chasing competitions. Advertising, this is Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition 2014. I haven't been able to find the Sports Illustrated Edition in the last couple of years because places that sell cigarettes that I normally go to haven't been selling the Swimsuit Edition of Sports Illustrated. So I haven't found one in the last couple of years. But uh, no, they don't use sex in selling e-cigarettes. And this doesn't appeal to young males especially. Vapor. There's no water in e-cigarette vapor, again. First thing you have to know is propylene glycol and sometimes glycerol. And actually in some, they've actually found ethylene glycol um, in these uh, solvents. Um, that, are that are dissolving and carrying the e-cigarette flavors and the nicotine. So there's very little quality control. There's no testing by the FDA to tell you exactly what's in all these things. And so nobody really knows what it is you're vaping. So the industry likes to make believe that e-cigarette vapor is harmless water vapor. There's no water. From a toxicology standpoint, vapor should be called an aerosol, not a vapor, an aerosol. And aerosol. Compare the e-cigarette aerosol to clean air, not to cigarette smoke. Why would you compare it to cigarette smoke? Just compare it to clean air. It's far worse than clean air. Uh, it's probably not as bad as cigarette smoke, but we're not sure. With the fine particles that are produced in e-cigarette aerosol, um, it's definitely going to have an effect on your cardiovascular system, just like secondhand smoke is on your cardiovascular system. Or compare clean water to so-so water. Which one do you choose? So the tobacco industry history of harm reduction conspiracies. So the industry has used harm reduction. And actually, some researchers have used harm reduction to promote various different devices over the last you know, 100 years. So cigarettes first were advertised as safer than chewing tobacco and snuff. They claim that smoking decreases the spread of tuberculosis by decreasing spitting on sidewalks. It did increase, decrease the spitting, but cigarettes are more dangerous than either chewing tobacco or snuff. Filters make cigarettes safer. Uh, some of the early filters in the early 50s actually had asbestos in them, uh, which makes, things, makes cigarette smoke far worse if you are around asbestos. And they do not reduce the harm. So the next harm reduction technique they used was low tar cigarettes. Industry assigned filters on cigarettes that would fool the test, which was actually run on their own machines. Um, it did not reduce the harm. Then they came out with low nicotine cigarettes. Again, industry assigned filters to fool the test, run on their own machines. It did not reduce the harm. Uh, in fact, there's some data that say it actually makes them worse. Um, we spent over $50 million with the National Cancer Institute trying to develop a safer cigarette. It did not work. And in fact, the scientists who ran that program then went to work for the tobacco industry. Now e-cigarettes are safe. Uh, no pre-production toxicity testing, um, no uh, science on cessation, uh, batteries that explode, poor quality control, and they're just as addicting. So are they really safer or not? So some of the things you can get from doing e-cigarettes, uh, lipoid pneumonia, inhaling glycerol, uh, will give you pictures like this, uh, CAT scan. Uh, this is lipoid pneumonia. 
and, and a number of people have already gotten this from smoking e-cigarettes. Um, the other one is uh, the diacetyls will give you pulmonary fibrosis where your lungs don't work very well anymore. And uh, as of two years ago, there were 134 reported instances of cigarettes exploding or causing fires reported to the FDA. Uh, since the number of e-cigarette users has gone up, there's probably more today. Um, this is a guy whose e-cigarette blew up in his mouth. He uh, lost part of his tongue, lost teeth. Uh, this guy had it in his pants pocket when it went off. He's had skin uh, grafts for third-degree burns. And there are many more. Go to the YouTube. Uh, go watch uh, e-cigarette explosions and type that in and watch some of the videos. Very impressive. So the FDA. Um, first, e-cigarettes can get a gateway, uh, can be a gateway to real cigarettes, smoking among non-smokers and young people. Second, there's no clear conclusive evidence that e-cigarette products are less harmful. Third, e-cigarettes may contain ingredients that are known to be toxic to humans. And furthermore, some e-cigarette products have been found to have design flaws, quality efficiencies, and inadequate labeling. So the labels on the outside of those bottles don't always jive with what's inside the bottle. So e-cigarette marketing. So how do they market? Why quit? Switch to blue. YouTube and internet. For those of y'all who are learning about this for school kids or other folks, you know, go spend some time on YouTube and the internet looking up some of these things uh, for yourself. There's some amazing videos out there showing you how to start if you don't know how to do it. Uh, how to change and modify your e-cigarettes to make them, quote, better, unquote. So just because you saw someone do it on YouTube or the Internet does not make it safe, smart, or wise. Remember that many of those people telling you how great e-cigarettes are make money from these ads and from those products. They have a big conflict of interest. This is IQOS. This is a new uh, product around the world. There's a couple of different brands uh, of this. This is a heat not burn product. Uh, here in the center, you stick a, you have a tobacco stick. You stick into this uh, um, heater device, essentially. And what it does, it heats up the uh, cigarette stick to 350 degrees centigrade. A normal cigarette burns about 600 degrees centigrade. Uh, it does cause pyrolysis, but produces less combustion products than a regular cigarette. There are still harmful toxins produced along with small particles. Uh, there has been little independent research on these products. Uh, please realize that with cigarettes, the more toxic pyrolysis products are actually produced at lower temperatures than at the high temperatures when you inhale. So e-cigarettes are cheaper than cigarettes, partially because a lot of states still haven't taxed them appropriately. And e-cigarettes versus cigarettes, yes, cigarettes are worse, but e-cigarettes are not harmless. Then again, nothing is worse than cigarettes. Nothing is more dangerous than cigarettes. So you're kind of faced with, uh, I put these three scenarios. So e-cig choice number one. E-cigarettes are the best thing since sliced bread. Only adults will pay attention to all of the ads. All the smokers will throw away their cigarettes and start vaping. They will gradually reduce their dose of nicotine and become nicotine-free. All of the e-cigarette and cigarette companies will then go out of business. So choice two, some smokers will use e-cigarettes to quit, but more will use e-cigarettes for dual use. That means cigarettes and e-cigarettes at the same time. They will vape when they can't smoke. Some will quit. And then there's choice number three. The major tobacco companies will own e-cigarette companies. There will be another 460 or more smaller e-cigarette companies. They will employ all of their advertising products to battle for market share. As we have seen with tobacco, to increase market share, they will need to recruit new vapors. That is children. Many smokers will be dual users. Some will actually quit smoking. So this is what the e-cigarette industry thinks of you. This is an actual ad for blue cigarettes. So tobacco industry business ethics. There is no evidence of any sort whatsoever over the last 65 year history of the tobacco industry actually having a shred of business ethics, with the exception of how to make the most money and to continue doing it. 
That is why they were called and named racketeers. That's why they are racketeers. The e-cigarette industry is part of the tobacco industry. Even though they like to separate themselves away from the big guys, they are part of the tobacco industry and part of the nicotine industry. So from my friend Stan Glantz, e-cigarette health benefits are the triumph of wishful thinking over data. And then I have a couple of references uh, pages for you guys to go look at. And uh, thank you. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Dunnington, for sharing your knowledge. It's definitely important that we remember um, and continue discussing those horrible tactics that the industry has used and that they continue to use. So thank you very much. Our next presenter is Marcella Bianco. She is the program manager for the Catch My Breath program and is responsible for the management and dissemination of the program in states across the nation. Marcella has over 12 years of experience working in the tobacco prevention and control. Her career in tobacco prevention began in 2005 when she worked for Floridians for Youth Tobacco Education as the South Florida Field Director. Marcella oversaw 13 South Florida counties to ensure requirements were met to pass the Floridians for Youth Tobacco Education Amendment 4 and restore funding for youth tobacco prevention, including the Students Working Against Tobacco, commonly known as SWAT. SWAT is a movement mobilizing youth to stand up and fight against the tobacco industry. Amendment 4 passed in the 2006 election by almost 70% majority vote and changed Florida's constitution. Marcella then worked for the Florida Department of Health in St. Lucie County as the Tobacco Prevention Program Manager, mobilizing the community for change in tobacco policy. In 2015, Marcella and her family relocated to Nashville, Tennessee for an opportunity to work at the Tennessee Department of Health as the Tobacco Prevention Program Director for the state. Through her local and state work experience, Marcella has built relationships with local, state, and national partners to change policy and social norms around tobacco. Marcella resides in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, where she enjoys living a healthy, active lifestyle with her family. And we're also thrilled to announce a partnership between CBS Health and Catch My Breath program to bring the Catch My Breath curriculum to all Say What groups across the state. By doing so, Say What members will be armed with the knowledge necessary to make healthy decisions about living tobacco-free through the Catch My Breath curriculum. Marcella, I'll pass it off to you. Thanks, Kathleen. I appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending the webinar um, this afternoon with us. I'm excited here today to talk about our youth e-cigarette prevention program, Catch My Breath, um, and thank you for the great introduction of my long history of tobacco prevention and control, um, especially on the local and state level. I'm going to move my slide. So uh, Catch Global Foundation, Catch My Breath is funded through Catch Global Foundation and in partnership with CVS Health. Catch Global Foundation was funded back in early 80s um, and they were primarily for physical activity and nutrition programs for schools to implement across the nation. In 2016, we had Dr. Stephen Kelbler, who is the UT professor and developer of our curriculum along with his team at UT, University of Tennessee, Texas, which I must clarify, so at the University of Texas, which many of you may have know him. Um, and he was also one of the um, senior health editors on the Surgeon General's report on e-cigarettes. So why was this developed and why did they go into tobacco prevention when they did physical activity and nutrition programs? It was created in response specifically to that 900% increase from 2011 to 2015 with youth using e-cigarettes. Currently, our program reach um, is in over 30 states, reaching over 200 middle and high schools and over 50,000 youth. We are fortunate enough to be in partnership with CVS Health. Back in September, a grant was written and be, we were awarded the grant. We're excited to be part of Be the First Initiative. In 2014, CVS Health took tobacco products out of their stores. With that commitment, they dedicated $50 million for five years towards youth tobacco prevention. We're excited to be part of the Be the First team. Um, there's many different 
organizations that they have funded with their initiatives. Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, the Truth Initiative, Stanford University um, has a whole tobacco prevention toolkit available online. And then um, also Yale has a video game that will be released later this month, free for all of you to use, um, for kids to use, all in regards to tobacco prevention and how to um, resist peer pressure. Right now, our goal um, is to reach over 200,000 kids annually by 2020. With being funded from CVS Health, we are avail offering our Catch My Breath program free to schools across the nation through 2020. When I first started back in October of last year with the Catch My Breath program, um, we had 14 priority states. Texas has always been a priority state. Um, when I sensed my relationship here in Tennessee, working on the um, statewide initiative in tobacco prevention and control, we added um, Tennessee as the 15th priority state. Since then, we have added five more states. We've added a part-time staff person to implement the Catch My Breath program, spread the word about Catch My Breath um, in some other states. So we've added um, a part-time staff person. Currently, right now, it's me, our part-time staff, and we just hired an, um, a full-time administrative assistant to work on the back end. So I'm going to go through the next few slides rather quickly um, because a lot of the information was already shared. Um, but we're winning the battle, as we know, on historic youth tobacco smoking rates in regards to traditional cigarettes. But there has been an increase in popularity with e-cigarettes amongst youth. But we have seen a short decline. And that was, um, this one was in 2016, which was a pretty drastic decline. Um, we're not quite sure of the exact reasoning behind this decline. Um, but as stated earlier, there is still another slow decline in um, e-cigarette use amongst youth. But don't let that fool you, because this is a huge concern. I was working up in Rhode Island, where they have one of the lowest tobacco rates. Um, at one point, it was down to just merely under 3%. Um, now it's currently over 4%, but because of the e-cigarette use amongst youth in Rhode Island at 19%, their tobacco um, rates have gone over 25%. So don't think, don't let it fool you that e-cigarettes are, are, not, are not a concern, especially just by looking at this brief data sheet. So specifically in Texas, um, I'm not going to go through and read the whole slide, but, um, you know, we have issues. We have issues across the nation. Um, so where we aren't that bad, we can still do better here. Um, and the slides will be available after you complete evaluation, so you will be able to access this information. Um, one of the great things about the Catch My Breath program when it was developed by Dr. Stephen Kebler at um, University of Texas is that it does um, meet peak. Um, it's met by Catch My Breath for both middle and high school. So it meets that curriculum for schools. Um, and you can see where, where it does. The, also, the exciting part of it is that it meets the national health standards, so the common core standards and the national um, health epidemic standards. Um, so that's something that's great, especially when you're working in schools and you're talking to teachers, that you know some teachers, they have so many things on their plate. They say, it's a great program, but I can't, don't know where I'm going to find the time to implement it. It meets one of their core standards, so it meets the requirements of what they have to do. Also in Texas, there is the e-cigarette um, legislative update regards to um, the recommendation that law passed Senate Bill 489 to have the SHAC, the School Health Advisory Council, review and make recommendations on curriculum to prevent the use of cigarette e-cigarettes. Um, Dallas ISD has approved this SHAC through the entire Dallas ISD to implement the Catch My Breath program. Um, it's not only in Dallas, it's in multiple different areas throughout Texas um, right now because where Texas, um, where Catch My Breath was developed and created and the outreach that we had in Texas, our main office is in Austin, Texas. Um, that's where we have the biggest outreach um, is in Texas with the Catch My Breath program. So th normally I am out there presenting face-to-face um, -face at some conferences. A lot of them are physical activity and um, physical education and nutrition classes, health education. Um, so a lot of times I'm presenting with a Zumbo class next, going on with me next door. So I've added some physical activity in, um, in my presentation. 
So whether you're in a group setting right now or if you're at your desk and you've been sitting for a while, um, probably for at least a half hour, almost probably almost 45 minutes, and it's a good time to do that, that stretch break. Um, so we offer a pop quiz, um, and I know this is via, via webinar, so I won't be hearing responses, but this is a, based off of the pre and post that we did in our 2016 pilot program to over 2,000 students in five different states. So if you think the answer is true, you can stand up and stretch at your desk and do five jumping jacks. If you think it's false, you can do five squats. So e-cigarette vapor contains mostly water, true or false. Uh, if you were a part of the beginning of this presentation, um, you'll know that it is false. It does not contain water. So youth, um, in the pre-survey, almost 34% of our youth um, in our pilot program thought that was true, that it's no, it's just water. After, it went down to 20%. Nicotine is addictive and harmful to the body. We've done a really good job um, educating our youth about this. Um, even my eight-year-old knows that it's harmful. So before it was 7% and after it went down to just under 4%. Um, so there's still a few out there that think that nicotine is not addictive, but we've done a really good, good job educating between our health educators, community partners, community-wide partners, and our, our Department of Health staff. Um, and, and parents educating our youth that nicotine is addictive and harmful to the body. So most e-cigarettes contain nicotine. We've already mentioned this as well earlier, and that is true. Most e-cigarettes do contain nicotine. Um, before, that was 18% of our youth thought that was false. And after going through our lesson, um, that dropped to 6%. They really understood that um, most e-cigarettes do contain nicotine, and it's not just flavored juice or water, and as we know, there is no water in e-cigarettes. Most sweet candy and fruit flavored e-cigarettes contain nicotine. Oh, well, yes, this is true. Um, so just because it tastes good and it smells good doesn't mean it's good for you. So 31% um, thought this answer was false before they went through our program. After going through our program, that dropped down to 13%. Um, youth really understood that yes, all flavors of tobacco contain nicotine. It is illegal for kids my age to use e-cigarettes. Um, and this is why on some of the um, slides prior, you know, listening to 21, the age of 21, this is true. Um, before that was 19 and after that was 14. Um, so yes, most, and why the difference is it could be 18 or 21. Most states and municipalities, it is 18 for um, illegal use. You, know, to be, you have to be 18 to be able to purchase um, a tobacco product, including e-cigarettes. But there are um, several municipalities and um, of states now that it is 21 is the legal age for youth to purchase um, tobacco products. You've already gone through this before. It's just a different picture. It's components of e-cigarettes. You know, the main thing is is that you have to have the heater. You have to have the heater that that uh, and the battery so that it heats up that liquid, that e-juice that's in in all of your um, e-cigarettes. Uh, one of the things that I like to point out, if you hear the kids using the term dripping, um, dripping is actually by um, kids are taking apart the e-cigarette, taking the e-juice liquid and dropping it right on the coil, that red portion, the coil of the e-cigarette to get a bigger high off it. It gets a stronger heat because you're skipping the rest of the component and you're going straight to the heater. So if you hear kids or youth talking about um, dripping, that's what they're talking about. You've already been seeing some of the types of e-cigarettes. The ones on the top are throwaways, so you buy them once, use it till they're done, and then throw it out. And then the ones on the bottom are more of the tanks or the pods, the refillable ones. We've also mentioned Juul. This is the number one youth e-cigarette that most kids are using. Um, I propose that eventually we'll have to take a look at our data set, our questionnaires, um, like the YRBS, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, and some of the tobacco prevention surveys out there. Um, that kids take because, as was noted earlier, kids, when they're using a Juul, they don't think they're vaping and they don't think they're doing e-cigarettes, they're dueling. So I would tend to think, if they think that's what they're doing that on the questionnaire, if it asks, have you ever used an e-cigarette or have you ever vaped, they may say no because they're actually not doing that. They've created their own verb and taken Juul to dueling. Here's the anatomy of a Juul. Um, the biggest thing, one of the biggest things to, to point out is that the dangerous effects of, of a dual pod, um, the liquid, which you see is a very small amount of liquid, 
tend to contain nicotine um, as much as a full pack of cigarettes. Um, most, a lot of the e-juice only contains two to three percent nicotine, where Juul is very um, proud on their site to say that every Juul pod is created the same and it contains nicotine as much of a pack of cigarettes. And here's the anatomy of a Juul. Um, Juuls have recently gone down in price too. A four pack of Juul pods is cheaper than a four pack of cigarettes. Um, I actually, when I first started working for Catch My Breath back in October, um, a Juul starter kit, which was, um, you've seen that picture previously, so you get the, the whole stick and in four different flavors, that ran you about $50, $60. Um, I saw just two weeks ago um, at one of the local gas stations that in a starter kit of Juul is down to $29.98. One other thing to note too with Juul is that the Juul company has stated that they're having a hard time keeping up with supply and demand um, for the product. We also mentioned that there's over 8,000 different flavors. Um, some flavors range from anything from pancake syrup to soda flavors. Um, on one prevention video I saw from California, there was even unicorn puke, um, which to me that sounds disgusting, but they're not advertising that to me. Um, and that is why also that the reports just came out earlier this year that the majority of youth, over 70% of the youth who use e-cigarettes will turn to combustible tobacco products. I am sure as a youth gets older, if they're using an e-cigarette, they will choose not to be doing unicorn puke flavoring because that would not be cool to them any longer. Playing exactly, those of you who've been around in tobacco prevention and control long enough, their e-cigarette companies are copying Big Tobacco's playbook to the T. If you remember the Marlboro Man, all three of them, which all three of them died from tobacco use. Um, blue does the same, all e-cigarettes come the same. A lot of you probably remember you've come a long way, baby, for Virginia Slims using sexuality and glamorous women in advertisement, using celebrity spokespeople in advertising. And then also going to different music festivals and sports events. Um, this has been, I'm sure some of you probably even worked on some different policy changes in your community. Um, I worked on one myself when I was the program manager for the tobacco prevention program in St. Lucie County, Florida, where we had a sting. We did a rodeo. There was a rodeo at our local fairgrounds, and we had, had our youth go down to see if they could give um, free samples because Grizzly Smokeless Tobacco was there handing out free samples of smokeless tobacco. Um, I still have pictures to this day of our kids going down there getting their free samples of tobacco products with our sheriff officer standing right there. Yes, that's classic. Um, so we worked with the Parks and Recs Department as well as the Fair Association, and they actually changed um, their vendor and changed their policy that they had to sign a contract. If they were going to be a vendor, they cannot hand out any free samples of tobacco products. Um, I wonder now if that looks like it has e-cigarettes in it, because that was quite a few years ago. Um, but that's the same thing that they're doing, sporting events, Within the past five years, we took Marlboro out of the and um, regular cigarettes out of NASCAR. Um, they also smoke, they also um, sponsor music events, whether it's music festivals, music, um, music, different music events. When I was again back in St. Lucie County, we had R.J. Reynolds was um, very active in promoting garage bands. They actually created um, CDs for these garage bands and would send it free to all of their customers to get the word out of their music. Um, E-cigarettes are playing the same playbook. They're doing the same exact thing. Um, this isn't quite the dramatic picture of an e-cigarette exploding, but this is a picture of an e-cigarette exploding. Um, we know the health effects. You know, We know what nicotine does. We know what nicotine does to the brain of our youth, the frontal cortex. Um, in youth, meaning 18, 21, kids should not be using nicotine. We know the developing brain of of a child goes up to the early um, and mid 20s. The unknown effects that were discussed earlier of all the other chemicals. We don't know the long-term effect of using these. Yes, the vegetable oil is okay to be eaten. Some of these other flavorings are okay to be eaten and digested through your system. They're not okay to be inhaled through your lungs. And the big thing that we already do see is the resocialization of tobacco use amongst our youth. Uh, one of the things that's really scary to me with e-cigarettes is that it's for anybody and anyone out there. Where traditional tobacco, combustible tobacco, would go usually towards the lowest socioeconomic groups, 
e-cigarettes are your football players, your athletes. Um, I'm seeing a lot of different, from working with some different schools, I see a lot of um, coaches complaining like certain athletic leagues, they see a lot of e-cigarette use. Um, so this is just a, an introduction. California has done a great job um, with a campaign to prevent, for, uh, show parents the dangers in e-cigarettes. Um, so this is just a short video. You can find all these online by going um, to YouTube, Real California Teens Talk About Vaping. There's an extra um, video that's on there. It's about three minutes long. If you have an opportunity, go out and check that. But um, now if we could just play this 30-second video. My name's Naomi, and I'm 14 years old. I was 13 the first time I vaped. Sometimes I do feel pressured into vaping, a lot of people post them on their Snapchat stories or on Instagram of them vaping. They tend to be more popular. People are just doing it to be cool. It might just be the fact that you're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. And then there's the next video that I'm going to show is from a lot of you may know him if you've gone to Say What and you're familiar with Say What is Dr. Victor DeNoble. Um, he was the whistleblower on the tobacco industry who worked for Philip Morris. Um, amazing gentleman, if you ever get to see him present. I uh, worked with him for over 10 years in Florida where I'd have him come into our community. He's partnered with a lot of different organizations and health departments, um, and he'll be at your Say What conference again this summer. But he um, worked with the Arizona Department of Health, and they developed claymation videos. Now, these, this is an e-cigarette video that you can show to your youth. We've actually included it. Um, on our website as um, additional support material through our, our, our curriculum through Catch My Breath. But we can go ahead and play this short to Noble Files video, please. Are e-cigarettes less harmful? Well, let's talk about some facts. Do you think your brain cares where nicotine comes from? Do you think your brain knows if you used a cigarette, a scar, spit tobacco, or an electronic cigarette? All your brain knows is nicotine is a drug, and it doesn't care where it comes from, and e-cigarettes deliver nicotine to your brain. Equally important is e-cigarettes have chemicals in them. Some of those chemicals we get from tobacco don't come from burning tobacco, they come from heating up nicotine. And what an e-cigarette does is it heats up nicotine. So it produces the same type of cancer-producing agents that you get from a tobacco product. Are they safer? Maybe. It's safer to jump off a 100-story building than a 300-story building. That's a true statement. It's safer, but the result is about the same. So is it safer? Um, you could probably say maybe. All your brain knows is that nicotine is an addictive drug, and I must begin to change. So electronic cigarettes will affect the same change in your brain that any other tobacco product does. Thank you. Those can also be found on YouTube. That's me. Next slide. Huh? I was waiting for you. Sorry, right, guys. So um, I'm just going to go over this briefly because I think this was discovered early, discussed earlier too, that youth are underappreciated in the debate on e-cigarettes and cessation. Um, our program, we don't talk about using e-cigarettes as cessation. Um, we just know that with for our program solely concentrated on youth, middle, and high school. And if you're a youth under 18, under 21, you shouldn't be using any um, nicotine addictive um, addictive drugs. And that's where our program goes. And we've already talked about a lot of this. So, the, so our program, Catch My Breath, was based on social cognitive theory. So what are my friends doing? The program focuses the same thing that we did, unfortunately, we're back right where we started from with combustible tobacco products is taking a look at disrupting the norm that everybody is doing e-cigarettes. Not everybody's doing e-cigarettes. The data is out there that not everybody does e-cigarettes. But depending upon who the youth, who their friends are, um, it appears to them that everybody is doing e-cigarettes. Developing the skills to resist peer pressure. Um, we saw this firsthand. Uh, we had a teacher from Ware, Massachusetts, um, who conducted our four lesson program to her seventh graders. Um, and then a week later, after completion of the program, one, she had one of her students come in and say that she was offered an e-cigarette and she was able to refuse that e-cigarette because of the skills that she had learned um, in our program. 
I was actually able to go up to Wareham Middle School a couple weeks ago and witness this particular session being um, taught to two of her classes. And it's really great to see the kids. Um, there's a peer-to-peer -peer component, which I'll talk about just a little bit. So the kids are, break out into groups, and they're peer-to-peer, they're -peer, and they talk about the issue of resistance and what would they say, what group settings would they be in to be offered an e-cigarette, and then what would they say to, to resist it. They discuss it, and then they break out into pairs, and then they do role play. Um, and it was really pretty interesting to see how the kids would react and what they would do. And then the reality, you know, what would they need to be really strong if someone were to ask them, would they be able to do that resistance? I'm um, looking at the advertising. We've seen so much of the e-cigarette advertising um, that is really targeted to our youth. I'm um, taking looking at that and um, see how the advertising um, affects our kids and gets them to use these e-cigarettes. Um, and one thing that I want to say with that too is that we really need to make aware for all schools and community-based organizations out there is that Juul is also playing another playbook that um, Traditional Tobacco did, which is coming out to schools, offering some financial assistance and offering a program that talks about how Juul is not um, for kids to use. Do not take tobacco industry money. Um, do not take their program. We have evidence from when they did it before, when Philip Morris had their program before, that they tried to get into our schools, and I witnessed this in St. Lucie County. Um, that's why partnerships and relationships like yours all that you have with your schools is so important. That if a school ever asks, should we take this into our schools and to our kids, say no. The evidence is there from traditional combustible tobacco that the industry was actually promoting their tobacco products and subliminal messages to kids. Um, and this was evidenced by the American Lung Association and the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. Um, and then also our program takes a look at um, creating the favorable attitudes and beliefs um, in this about e-cigarettes. Our program is designed um, for four lessons and it lasts 35 to 40 minutes each. Um, we recommend teaching one lesson up to four weeks. Um, we know that that sometimes doesn't happen. Sometimes you have to do a class, um, do it all in one week. Sometimes you're in a block schedule. So you can also do two lessons in two weeks. Um, this is a shortened version from what our big version was. Um, the content hasn't changed. We just took out some of the extra stuff. Our pilot program had six lessons, 55 minutes each. Teacher feedback was so important because they're like, it's too long. We can't implement it in that time frame. So that's when we took a look uh, last summer at the main content of our program, made it into four lessons, 35 to 40 minutes each. Um, and the other thing that great that came out from um, the teacher feedback survey is that we added a PE component and we understand that in Texas and in many other states and school districts they don't have um, necessarily health educators in all schools so the PE teacher often is tasked with doing the classroom based health education so we have the classroom based health education for the teacher the PE teacher and the standardized teacher in the classroom then we also have a PE component so there's a kids are doing calisthenics and relay races all around learning about e-cigarette use who can, who can teach this program? Um, middle school, high school teachers, PE teachers, um, community-based organizations. We have um, many different community-based organizations that are helping implement the program. Um, Boys and Girls Club are doing it. YMCAs are doing it. So um, we have a lot of our health departments that are going in um, and implementing the program as well. Um, these are the posters that each school gets if, once they register. They get three of each poster depending upon if they're in middle or high school. The posters on the left are in middle school and the posters on the right are in high school. Our pilot program in 2016 only had a middle school program. This past year from 2017-2018 school year we created and implemented a high school version. The three posters on the right, and I know we did this for, um, this before I came, but I know we did this for the other posters as well. While our design team that Catch Global um, helped design the posters, they were actually sent out to, there was more than this that was developed, and they were sent out to teams across the nation in different organizations for them to take a look at and give some uh, focus groups and feedback from youth. What does, what does it look like for kids to use this? Oh, where am I going? There we go. So here's the catch my breath. You can go ahead and play the video as I'm talking. That's fine. Um, this is a sample of what the lesson looks like online. 
Um, it's really simple to go through. It's just everything is simple right there for you um, online. Each lesson by grade level. We also have a teacher education resource. We have a parent resource, which is great for you. You can go to the next slide. The parent resource is excellent. They don't have to be a registered user. They can just go to the um, Catch My Breath website and see the parent um, resource tab and click on to that for the parent resources to learn more about e-cigarettes. Here's a sample view of the program. And that's basically what I was just talking about. The training for the, the program for a teacher to be able to use or uh, someone to be able to implement the Catch My Breath program is an online video for 55 minutes. Um, and I'm going to go through the registration um, process in just a minute. One of the things that I have done too for some of the larger school districts and some of our um, Texas staff can do this as well, or I can do it via um, webinar based, but it's actually to do the training online. So like for Dallas ISD, they had an in-service and I went down there for the in-service and registered, I don't know, I think it was over 50 teachers um, in the program. We went through the training, um, we got their access code and they were able to access the program and be ready to go with the program as soon as they left the in-service. So they didn't have to um, participate in the training online. But I can also do that via webinar as an option. So here's just a quick sample lesson. Um, this is session two, uh, making our own choices for the high school program. And why there's a variation of 35 to 40 minutes, you can see how each um, activity is drawn out by minutes, so like introduction, five minutes. The next um, direct introduction is, is instruction is the next five to ten minutes. So there's a little bit of leeway time. Um, and it depends on your interaction with your students, too. If you have students that are more involved, a session may go a little bit longer. Teachers really like that this is completely lined out for them. So this way they didn't have to worry about doing an, a lesson plan and, and how are they going to implement it. It's all online for them. Anything that you see in green, is um, something that you can click on and it's either a PowerPoint or a spreadsheet or something for you to take a look at um, that you can use for your classroom. Based off of our 2016 pilot program, um, teacher feedback, the lessons were culturally appropriate, they felt confident, and that's one of our big things. Um, we know that teachers are tasked to do so much um, and they don't have the, necessarily have the time to take and learn all about the true facts, especially with how the e-cigarette industry is ever changing. Um, so they like that they were able to, their ability to be able to teach the program. Um, and they like the student, um, the students like the lessons, especially the peer-to-peer -peer component. Um, and this is some of the student feedback. When I was up in uh, Rhode Island, I was able to go to a different school. And they stressed some of the kids, they were able to talk to some of the kids. And what they found that they liked the most was the peer-to-peer -peer component. Because it was a safe setting for them to talk about the emerging issue of e-cigarettes. Um, it's not something that they normally do but they felt that it was really comfortable for them to do it within the safe setting of our program. So the biggest thing for, you know, how can we make Catch My Breath work? Um, awareness recruiting training. So like I said, um, I'm available to do um, webinar training. We have staff in Texas, or we could come down and do a training to um, a school district. Um, and then one of the things that I also, am, as I stated earlier, that I, I take pride in, is that I see every registration that comes through. Although registration doesn't have my email address, it comes right to me. Um, we're a small team, so right now it's my intern and my full-time administrative assistant that are processing all of the applications and we're asking, we're answering all the questions. We do have a 24 to 48 hour turnaround time for anything feedback, so we take pride in that technical assistance that we can provide to each, each teacher or each community-based organization that's implementing the program. So how do you start? Um, you go on to the sketchmybreath.org slash enroll. Um, it's really simple and easy to do. There's a short form. You fill out the teacher's name um, and their information. If there's a catch champion, um, fill out that information as well as the principal's name. And then just some information about the school. If it's um, middle or high school, how many students, um, when do they plan on teaching it? The when is important because we do a lot of um, touch points with our teachers. Um, when you start the program, two weeks beforehand, we will send out the posters. Um, this way they're not sitting in the office. If you don't, we have schools signing up now for August. We don't send out the posters now. We'll send them out two weeks before the scheduled start date. 
Uh, we do a touch point. We do offer pre and post surveys. It's not mandatory, but you can do a pre and post survey. We do that two weeks before it's scheduling to start. And then we do a touch point halfway through the program, sending you the post survey. And then after the classes should be done, we send you the teacher feedback survey. Um, and basically, that's it. So what happens is you submit the form. We see it. Within 24 to 48 hours, we send out a welcome email to all three participants if they're all filled out, the teacher, the catch champion, and the principal. We like to get welcome, welcoming them to the program. We like to get a sent from the teacher stating that, um, you know, this is great, this is good, thank you, we're looking forward to the program. Why we like to have teacher assent is because of posters are being put up in, your, in the schools, and then also it is a prevention program on a substance abuse, you know, the something illegal to students. Um, so we do like to hear back from the principal. As soon as we hear back from the principal, within 24 to 48 hours, a, the teacher will have the access code and they have full access to the program. Our program is completely online. So once you have your access code, you do not have to wait for anything to come in the mail besides the posters. Your program is completely online. One of the great things about that too is that we can make updates as needed so for instance, when Juul became the number one selling e-cigarette amongst youth in January, by the end of February, we had that added to our program. So um, it lets the, the giver provides information for the teacher about Juul, as well as letting the students know that, hey, we know Juul's out there, and we know that it could be used here in this classroom, so we're aware of it. Um, you, didn't have, you don't have a three-ring binder sitting on your desk or sitting in your closet, and then having to get updated information sent via mail. Everything is directly online. And so just a little comic, yeah, sure, they're not as dangerous as tobacco. Well, unless I'm not quite sure. I don't think they are. And this is our catch team. Um, this email also goes straight to me, um, catchmybreath at catch.org. Um, that goes to a few of us at the Catch, um, at the catch Global Foundation. Um, my personal email is Marcella, which is real simple, M-A-R-C-E-L-L-A -L -L -A, at catch.org. That's it. Thank you so much. And I, um, if you have any questions, you can type them in. Um, and, you know, I look forward to working with all of you um, there in Texas and seeing you at the Say What conference this summer. Thank you, Marcella, so much for providing that wonderful information on how we can equip um, community members, teachers, schools in general um, to educate youth. Uh, so just a reminder, we want to remind everyone <laughs> to stay tuned for future tobacco prevention education resources coming in the fall of 2018, which will be made available through the CVS uh, Health Partnership. And those materials would be examples such as the Catch My Breath curriculum. So in order to be a part of that and to get that, we want you to sign up on our website um, and uh, become a member of the Say What website. So uh, at this time, we will take questions for our presenters. We will give you uh, a, a minute to type your questions up. Um, but just to get started, we do have a question for you, Marcella. Um, when you had talked about community groups uh, are also able to use the uh, curriculum and receive the training, but how exactly can they sign up for that? You had mentioned you'd need to know the school name, the principal name some different things like that that wouldn't apply to a, a community group that's not implemented in a school setting. So if you could just uh, answer that, we would appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, we have several um, organizations that are doing that. Um, we have some, actually some Department of Health that are doing that in Texas where they work in multiple different schools. So what we do is we ask um, that you register as an organization, and then we ask that you still register each school as you're getting ready to go in. We are grant funded, so those of you who know about being grant funded, we do have numbers that we have to capture. Um, so if you could register each school, listing yourself as the catch champion, um, I will note of that. And then, um, you know, we just, we won't send, we still send a welcome email to the principal and to the teacher, but we do not, um, you will not need another access code. You'll be, and we make, want to make sure we send the posters. That's the way the schools would get the posters as well. This way we can capture the numbers. We need to capture schools. We have a certain population that reach that we have to do, how many schools and how many students that we have to reach through our grant from CBS Health. <laughs> okay, we have another question for you, Marcella. Um, this comes from Jennifer Payne. What is the cost for nonprofit organizations that partner with multiple schools and districts? It is free. The cost is free. No charge.
Okay, um, and then another one, how can health educators who work in communities and schools be trained and receive materials to implement the program? That was the same process that I just explained. So to go through the registration um, link that was provided on this, um, on the webinar, on the PowerPoint. What I could also do is send out um, the link to you all, Kathleen, so that this way um, you can send it out to everybody who's, who's on the call today, you know, who's on the conference call today. Uh, but it's the same exact thing. We ask that you register so that you have a code for your um, for your entity, your community base, whether you're from a Department of Health or your entity that you're working with, and that we then that's the training will be in there, um, as well as uh, then after that we ask that you register each school, so that this way we know the numbers of how many schools and what's the reach, and the schools will get their posters that way. Um, it depends on how big your organization is and how many people you're looking at. I could also host a webinar to provide that training and to be able to sign you all up. That would be fantastic, Marcella. And the team at Say What, we would more than happy to get with you to host that for uh, Say What members. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll wait another couple of seconds to see if we have another question pop up. Um, questions for Dr. Dunnington um, and for Marcella as well. Well, if there are any questions left unanswered, maybe you think of later on uh, today or tomorrow, please reach out to us with the contact information we are about to show you. Um, and then we can direct those questions to the appropriate presenter, or if it's a question for us, we can answer it. Um, as a reminder, a recording of this webinar, it will be accessible through the Say What website on April 20th. But also, you will receive a brief survey about today's webinar through the email address you provided during registration. And once you complete that survey, you will receive access to the slides presented today. And we thank you again for joining us this afternoon. And this concludes our webinar for today.